It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the member for Brampton Centre. Thank you and good morning, Speaker. Um, my question is to the Premier. Since Ontario reported its first case of COVID-19 in January, 3,576 people have lost their lives. And while the Premier likes to brag that he's doing well, over 3,000 families have lost a parent, a grandparent, or in some tragic cases, Speaker, they have even lost a child. Every one of those deaths is a tragedy. And yesterday, the Auditor General came forward with a thorough review highlighting the failures of the previous Liberal government and this current government's failure to act. She also offered serious and constructive recommendations on ways to protect human life throughout this pandemic. Will the Premier stop attacking her for doing that and start implementing her recommendations? To respond, the Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Good morning, Speaker, and thank you. Well, of course, it's, we offer our condolences to all of those families of the 3,576 people who have died because of COVID-19. It's a tragedy. It, uh, we, none of us wanted to lose even one life, and we're working very hard to protect the health and well-being of every single Ontarian. The report of the, of the Auditor General uh, did contain some uh, important uh, ideas about how to deal with some of the systemic problems that she has witnessed over the years, and we were already in the process of implementing some of them, including the modernization of our public health system when, of course, we were struck by COVID-19. However, some of the issues that she raised were um, issues that were not followed by the previous government, and we had to quick, quickly act in order to deal with them, and we were able to do that. Response? Thank you. The supplementary question. Speaker, throughout the second wave of the pandemic, families have watched nervously as the Premier and his team offered confusing and contradictory directions, claiming to have the support of public health experts who, in reality, actually disagreed with them. Leadership means accepting criticism and listening to advice that you may not want to hear. Why is the Premier so unwilling to do that and so unable to admit any flaws in this government's COVID-19 response? Mr. Health. Well, in fact, uh, we have indicated that there were some important recommendations that the um, Auditor General made, specifically with respect to some of the issues that hadn't been dealt with for many years. For example, the pandemic response plan had not been updated since 2013. 2013 to 2018, absolutely nothing was done. There was also a report by the Lab Services Expert Panel in 2015 that commented that we needed to do more to build up our lab panel in the province of Ontario. This was commented on by the Auditor General in her 2017 report. Again, nothing was done. So that by the time we were faced with the pandemic, we had to create a coordinated lab system, which did not exist, and we did that in record time. And now the the numbers speak for themselves because Ontario now has the lowest rate per capita per 100,000 of any jurisdiction in North America, save and Response. except the Atlantic bubble and the, and the territories. So the numbers speak for themselves. The final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Um, well, parents are worried about their kids losing another year of school. Business owners are facing bankruptcy and many of them closing. Working people have lost their jobs and thousands thousands have lost loved ones. These folks need to know that their government is doing everything it can to protect our community and prevent deaths. But yesterday, they saw a Premier defending his right to make decisions behind closed doors and attacking a woman who dared to challenge him. That's not leadership. When will the Premier start listening to advice from not only the Auditor General, but doctors, public health experts, and frontline heroes from across our province? Minister of Health. Our government is certainly listening to the experts in public health. We are listening to uh, Dr. Williams, our Chief Medical Officer of Health. We're listening to the Public Health Measures Table. We're listening to Public Health Ontario. And all of the decisions that we have made thus far have been based upon the recommendations that have come to us from the health experts. We are not doctors over here. I'm not a public health specialist. I need to take the advice from those who are. That's what I've done. That's what the Premier's done. That's what our government has done throughout. We are 
are taking every step possible that we can to protect the health and well-being of Ontarians, but still being able to keep our schools open. That is so important for the social and uh, mental development of our children, protecting our most vulnerable, and protecting our communities. That's been our focus from the beginning and will always be. Thank you. The next question, the member for Temiskaming Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The Premier's contempt for the Auditor General was on full display yesterday. And she is an independent, expert, third party opinion, an independent officer of this House. His comments showed a total lack of respect for that expertise. The real question is. If that's how the Premier responds when an independent officer of the House offers a, offers a critical opinion, how are we expected to believe that he would accept the opinion of the Chief Medical Officer of Health, that he would actually allow the Chief Medical Officer of Health behind closed doors to offer an expert opinion and to abide by it? How are we ever to believe that? Mr. Hill. Thank you. Well, the reality is we have great respect for the Auditor General. We recognize that there are some situations where there are some criticisms that we are certainly able to accept. We are working on some of the recommendations that she's made in past years, including public health modernization. That was underway at the time that COVID struck. But as far as the Chief Medical Officer of Health is concerned, we have been taking his advice. Uh, you may recall that the Auditor General, uh, sorry, the uh, Chief Medical Officer of Health was uh, at the select committee in this House Legislature last Friday, and he was asked whether we, as a government, were listening to his recommendations, and his response was yes. Supplementary question. The government knew yesterday's damning report was coming. They knew the Auditor General was raising serious concerns about the role of the Chief Medical Officer of Health. And yet, once again in the dead of night, they tried to force through an extension of the contract without any outside vision. Instead of doing everything we can to ensure that the Chief Medical Officer of Health in Ontario is ready to handle future waves of this pandemic, will be voting on a motion to rubber stamp that extension Order. from now. Will the Premier do the responsible thing, pull that motion, and agree to have the Chief Medical Officer appear before an all-party committee to consider extending his appointment? The government house leader to respond. Again, Mr. Speaker, that uh, appointment uh, uh, was uh, taken over two, uh, two evenings, uh, uh, Speaker. Uh, there will be a vote after question period today, and I remind the Honourable Gentleman that when a motion was brought forward to this House to have the Chief Medical Officer of Health appear before uh, the Select Committee with respect to this appointment, the NDP turned that down. Order. The final supplementary. The Auditor General was simply saying what numerous health experts and frontline staff and hospitals and long-term care have been saying for months. It's time to stop gagging health experts advising the government. The auditor recommended that the government follow the recommendation of the SARS Commission, which is and ensure all recommendations made by the Chief Medical Officer of Health are released publicly in order to ensure transparency for the people of Ontario. The people of Ontario deserve to know what advice the Chief Medical Officer of Health is giving to the Premier. Will he release that information? Minister of Health. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Well, in fact, that information is released virtually on a daily basis. Virtually on a daily basis. We, the Chief Medical Officer of Health spoke on the Select Committee last week. He indicated very clearly that he makes his recommendations. His recommendations are accepted by us. And then we make the policy that goes through Cabinet, and then it's publicly reported. In addition, 
Dr. Williams appears twice a week at his own briefings without any politicians around to answer questions of the media, to answer questions that are coming from the, the issues that the public wants to know about. Dr. Williams has been front and centre leading the public health response to this throughout. Nobody's gagged, nobody's muzzled. We are listening to what our public health experts have to tell us, and we are following their recommendations. And we've come through this. There have response. been 3,576 deaths. That is very, very sad, and I'm not bragging about what, where we are. However, it is important to note that Ontario does have the lowest rate per 100,000 of any jurisdiction in North America. So clearly, we must be doing something right, and we must be listening. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Nickel Belt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The Auditor General was very clear in her report. One of the reasons we are behind in our COVID-19 response is because the formal Liberal government refused for over a decade to implement important recommendations from the Auditor General, to implement the recommendations from the SARS Commission, and implement numerous other reports. Speaker, it's been over two and a half years since this government came to office, bringing with them big promises to clean up the liberal waste and patronage appointment. Except, really, the only thing we've seen is that they've managed to do is to replace them with their own. Uh, so we know that the Premier has not kept uh, that promise. Does he have any regret? Good help. Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the member very much for the question. In fact, you are absolutely right. We uh, were behind in terms of our ability to start dealing with the COVID-19 crisis because of the fact that the previous government had not followed up on the recommendations of the Auditor General, had not followed up from 2000 to 200, 2013 to 2018 to follow up on Order. the pandemic plan, had not done the work necessary to create a coordinated lab sequence. We did that. We did that in record time. We now have a coordinated system. We've updated the technology to connect the labs with the uh, testing stations. We have uh, moved forward with public health modernization, which is something that was recommended by the Auditor General. We were moving forward to deal with some of the issues that had been, quite frankly, neglected by the previous government. Yep. And we did that in record time during the midst of a pandemic Response. with the assistance of Dr. Williams and all of the public health experts that were advising us. Supplementary question. Speaker, we also learned yesterday from the Auditor General fact-based report was that on top of sitting on important recommendations, the former Liberal government also refused to update the province emergency preparedness plan and strategy. So again to the Speaker, to the Premier Speaker, it has been two and a half years. Will the government admit that their choice not to fix these liberal messes sooner took us from a bad situation and made things much, much worse than they needed to be? Mr. Pell. Thank you, Speaker. What I would say is it's very unfortunate that we were left in this situation when the pandemic started because of the inaction of the previous government. However, we did rise to the occasion because it's a pandemic, lives depended on it, and we acted quickly. We were the first province to indicate that uh, COVID-19 was a reportable disease, which allowed the local medical officers of health to start their work in testing and contact tracing. We were the first to uh, close our schools to protect our children. We were the second to declare a state of emergency right after Quebec, and we launched into action immediately because we knew that quick action had to be taken. So we're able to increase our testing Order. from 4,000 tests per day. We're now at the point where we can test 70,000 per day. We did 47,000 tests yesterday. We have a connected lab system. We have the 34 medical officers Response. in constant contact with Dr. Williams, providing us the local uh, responses to what they need to do, coordinated by Dr. Williams. So we have created a system to deal with the pandemic in record time. And Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Mississauga Streetsville. Good morning, Speaker. In September, our government introduced its return to school plan. 
This comprehensive plan has enabled our children to continue with their education, has allowed for vital and safe socialization in occurrence, and has given parents comfort that their children are safe in these difficult times. We have seen countless medical professionals speak up in support of the government's plan and about the need to keep schools open for the benefit of all children in Ontario. With that in mind, would the Minister of Education please share the efforts the government has taken so far that has led to the safe reopening of schools? Thank you. Mr. Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member from Mississauga Streetsville for the question and for the interest in ensuring that Ontario students can go to class safely each and every day. We are at the halfway mark almost uh, in this school year, and I think we should, irrespective of our political differences, acknowledge the massive amount of work by our frontline doctors, nurses, teachers, EAs, ECEs, principals, everyone on the front lines working together. If there is one truth we could accept as a legislator, it is that there is a real focus and collaboration happening on the ground to keep our kids safe. 1.5 million children in this province are learning each and every day with every layer of prevention in place, endorsed by the Chief Medical Officer of Health, the very individual who gave us the advice, supported by all parties, to close schools in the spring and reopen them this September. We have fully funded our plan. We have over 2,700 more teachers, over 1,200 more custodians, Spons? over 148,000 more devices, and more than 600 Order. public health nurses. Together, these investments, our protocol is keeping our province and our kids sure. safe. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for the answer. Schools remaining open is invaluable for our children and parents alike. During this second wave, we are seeing a troubling pattern of growing case numbers in the community, and it has been said multiple times by Dr. Williams, Dr. Yaffe, and many other medical professionals that schools reflect the community that they are in. Would the minister be able to share what new efforts the government is taking in order to combat COVID-19 in hotspot areas in order to protect students, education staff, order. and their families? Thank you. Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker, for that opportunity. I want to uh, invoke uh, the Chief Medical Officer of London, uh, Chris Mackey, whom I spoke to recently. Uh, members opposite were heckling sort of who can make these claims. Well, let's listen to the Chief Medical Officer of London. Perhaps he's an authority to the members and the New Democrats and Liberals. Quote, a lot of what is happening in schools is a reflection of what is happening in the general community. Our schools have excellent protocols, no doubt, but that's the case for school boards across this province. End quote. The truth is, Speaker, there is an acknowledgement and a consensus amongst the medical community. First off, that schools remaining open are foundational to the wellness and the mental health of our kids. I think we could accept that premise collectively. The second is that the intervention we put in place, the protocols, the layers of prevention, the investments in airflow in air, in air improvement, the investments in hiring of teachers, in distancing, and the actions we've taken to cohort kids, all of this, led by our frontline staff in education, are keeping kids safe. And it is not a coincidence, Speaker, that when you compare us Response? to Quebec, we ha they have four times higher cases per 100,000 in schools. We are doing something right. We're going to continue today to build up our plan and keep all staff, all students safe in Ontario. The official opposition will come to order. The next question, the member for Waterloo. Uh, thank you. My question is to the Premier. Yesterday, the Premier stood at his podium and attacked the Auditor General for raising crucial questions about his own choices and his government's COVID-19 response. It was weird, though. Uh, while the Premier had harsh words about the AG when it's his own inaction that's being called out, he had nothing but praise for her when she was doing her job under the previous government. Uh, and I'd like to quote, this is what the Premier had said, unlike the Liberals, we respect the Auditor General, we res respect working with the Auditor General, unquote. And this Health Minister had glowing reviews for the AG's work when it wasn't her job on the line as well. And I'd like to quote, she has said, we do support the work of the Auditor General, we do listen to what she has said, we think she is thoroughly competent, she knows what she's doing. This government used to believe that value for money audits are an important accountability tool. So my question is question? to the Premier. What has changed? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. We do respect the work of the Auditor General. We always have. However, in the case of this particular report, there were some factual inaccuracies that we raised to the Auditor General and asked to have an opportunity to discuss them. 
The Auditor General points to a document that she indicates was signed off by the Deputy Minister of Health, indicating that the Deputy Minister agreed with the contents of the report. In fact, the document that was signed by the Deputy Minister simply indicated that she had provided the Auditor General with all of the information that the Auditor General had requested pertaining to her investigation, but also attached 21 pages of factual inaccuracies. That's what we object to. We want the report to be based on the actual facts, and we have a disagreement with the Auditor General on many of the contents of the report Response? that were not factually accurate. Supplementary question. I never thought I would hear a minister in this House challenge the qualifications of the Auditor General. Yeah. Speaker, and it's not just the Premier and his health minister who were praising the Auditor sure. General Government in side, the past. Come the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing told us, and I'd like to quote, our independent officers of the legislature exist to provide the public with unbiased reports and recommendations that rise above the politics of this place. And I find it disgusting that the government would risk eroding the confidence and trust in those officers because they fear taking an electoral hit. Or the culture minister has said, and I quote, Ms. Lizick plays an essential role in holding our government accountable. Her work should be valued and commended, not disregarded and demeaned as the government has Order. done in the past. Gee, I wonder what has changed. Speaker, the government's choices have hurt the people of this side province. Comes to order. Attacking the Auditor General does Question. not change that. Will they admit that this isn't about the AG? It is about their own failures to act on behalf of the people of this province. Mr. Bell. Absolutely not. In no way are we challenging the qualifications of the Auditor General, neither myself, nor the Premier, nor anyone in this government. The Auditor General does play a very important role as an independent officer of the Legislature. I completely respect that. However, it is important that the information that is coming to the Auditor General and upon which she bases her reports are, are factual, factually correct. In many cases, the information was not correct. For instance, any suggestion that we were slow in starting our response to COVID-19 is not correct. Any suggestion that we were not relying on the advice of Dr. Williams Order. is not correct. There were many inaccuracies that the Deputy Minister tried to bring to the attention of the Auditor General. Dr. Williams did as well, and I did as well. I only found out about this report coming forward the day before response. it came forward. I asked the Auditor General to delay the publication of a report so that we could deal with these issues and try and resolve these discrepancies, but the Auditor General refused to do that. The next question, the member for Orléans. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. The Auditor General revealed the multi-million dollar organizational chart that the Premier has put in place for the COVID-19 response. A structure comprised of some 30 committees, over 500 participants, with the most important committee being the central coordination table. And when, the when the Auditor highlighted the challenges with this cumbersome uh, process, the Premier told her to stick to her job. The job she was hired for, uh, she wasn't a health professional, and so this wasn't her place. Basically, Mr. Speaker, the Premier told the auditor to stick to her knitting. Well, Ontario has hired a chief medical, of, a chief medical officer of health to provide health leadership. The chief medical officer isn't a part of this committee. In fact, Mr. Speaker, the committee is comprised of career bureaucrats, professional communicators, and political operatives. So why did the Premier pay millions of dollars Question. for a slow, bureaucratic, cumbersome committee full of red tape to hear from people he doesn't believe have the expertise to provide health advice? Mr. Health. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. Well, the member has raised another area where there were perhaps a misunderstanding or some factual inaccuracies in the report of the Auditor General. There were several tables that she spoke about. One was the central command table. That was never set up to be a health table. That was set up as a table that was going to coordinate the response among the many government ministries who had a role to play in dealing with COVID-19. It wasn't just about health. It wasn't just about long-term care. It was about many ministries, Solicitor General, education, colleges and universities, many. So it was to help uh, get the ministries out of their silos and be able to speak to each other because that communication is essential, quick communication when you're dealing with a pandemic 
being able to make those decisions quickly. It was not meant to be a, a health table in the sense of having public health specialists there. It was a coordination table. Response. Now, Dr. Williams did get involved from time to time when they were discussing specific health issues, but the main table for dealing with the health issues was the command table, which we are required to set up during a, a, a pandemic. That was set up. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My supplemental is also for the Premier. For months, Mr. Speaker, the Premier told Ontarians he was listening to doctors. Doctors would guide uh, his government's actions. Doctors would inform the government on what they should do to handle the pandemic. But like most Ontarians, Mr. Speaker, I thought the Premier was talking about medical doctors. But lo and behold, thanks to the excellent work of the Auditor General, we learned that the pandemic's most important committee, the one that filters all of the advice and information to Cabinet, the one that the Minister claims is responsible for the whole of government approach, doesn't actually include the province's most senior medical professional. In fact, Mr. Speaker, the most important committee responding to COVID-19 is full of political operatives, spin doctors, Mr. Speaker, who uh, contribute to providing uh, COVID-19 advice. So why is the government filtering their COVID-19 advice through political and communications advisors instead of allowing medical experts, medical leaders, to do the job the government hired them for to provide advice? Mr. Health. Well, um, as I just indicated, the central command table was not the one that made the health decisions. That was at the health command table, of which Dr. Williams was deeply involved. He was at every single meeting, as were the public health Ontario, as was the public health measures table, which had a number of the local medical officers of health on that committee, as well as other public health experts. That was the table that advised the government about the measures they were recommending that we take. And I don't know, maybe perhaps the uh, member didn't see the, the uh, presentation made by Dr. Williams at the select committee last week, where he was specifically asked if the government was following his recommendations, and he indicated yes. He's also available twice a week to the members of the media and to the public to answer questions. He's Honestly. indicated very clearly that we have been listening to the health advice here, we have been receiving here, since the beginning of this pandemic, here, here. and we will keep on doing so. Here, here. Here, here. Thank you. The next question, the member for Mississauga Streetsville. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Minister, as you know, we are now in the second wave of the pandemic and the cold weather has arrived. The government took decisive action during the first wave and announced the first phase of the social services relief funding, which went directly to service managers and Indigenous partners. This funding was critical to provide urgent funding for rent banks, purchase PPE, and expand homeless shelters, especially in Peel Region and my riding of Mississauga Streetsville. Can you please explain what your government has done to prepare for our most vulnerable for the second wave ahead of the winter months? Thank you. Thank you. The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thanks, uh, thanks, Speaker. And I want to thank the, the member from Mississauga Streetsville, not just for the question, but her tremendous advocacy in the city of Mississauga and the region of Peel. So thank you very much for the question. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased to stand in the House today to speak to our government's commitment to help uh, the most vulnerable, especially in the face of the second wave of COVID-19. Uh, last month, uh, Speaker, I was uh, pleased to stand, proud to stand, with our Premier and, and fellow ministers to announce the second phase of our Social Services Relief Fund. This uh, funding is part of our government's $510 million investment to support uh, homeless shelters, create and renovate more than 1,500 housing units, and provide additional fundings for rent banks across Ontario. Our most vulnerable need our support speaker, and I'm proud that our government stands with them, investing in their safety. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing for that response. Minister, as the member for Mississauga Streetsville, I know that people in my riding have been hard hit throughout the pandemic, including our most vulnerable. I want to be able to tell my constituents exactly how our government is helping vulnerable Ontarians in my riding. Can you please explain how this funding will be used in Peel Region to protect those who need our help? Thank you. 
Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, thanks again, Speaker. Through you to uh, the member for Mississauga Streetville, uh, that is a very important question. Our government recently approved the Region of Peel's entire business case for their second round of the Social Services Relief Fund funding. This means that Peel Region will receive $9.7 million in new funding for important initiatives like providing rent assistance for an additional 625 households, the acquisition of an emergency family shelter, upgrades to existing shelters in the region, hiring new staff, purchasing food, new linens, new PPE. Mr. Speaker, these investments will ensure that our partners have the resources that they need to protect our most vulnerable citizens that continue to battle this crisis. Thank you for the question. The next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good morning. My question is to the Premier. Yesterday's Auditor General report revealed the government spent $1.6 million to develop the government's confusing and very ineffective command structure, and another $3.2 million to develop their disastrous school reopening plan. All of this money, nearly $5 million public dollars went to consultant companies rather than to keeping the people of Ontario, the children of Ontario, safe from COVID-19. How can the government possibly justify these astronomical expenses? Education. Mr. Speaker, we have unveiled a plan with $1.3 billion of investment. Here, here. That should not be an abstraction to members opposite. It happens to be the highest investment of any province in this country by far. And why? Why did we do that? Why did we unlock $1.3 billion of federal dollars, of reserve dollars, and of provincial monies? Because in this province, this government believes the continuity of learning is important, is foundational, and we will do everything we can to safeguard the gains, the progress made by our frontline teachers, parents, and kids to keep schools open. It's why the Minister of Health, under her leadership and the Premier, have taken action province-wide with further restrictions to ensure we keep schools open, to ensure our kids and our seniors and the most vulnerable remain safe. We will continue today and those and going forward to build up our plan, respond to this risk, and do everything possible to reduce community transmission in this province. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I understand why the minister doesn't want to respond to this, because half the schools in this province now have COVID-19 cases. Every single dollar that you put, that this government puts in the pocket of consultants is a dollar that should have gone to keeping families in this province safe. And the truth is that this government didn't like what teachers and epidemiologists, what the experts at SIGKIDS, what parents, the advice they were giving them for free. They didn't like it, so they went out and they paid U.S. consultants millions of dollars to tell them what they wanted to hear. Yes. Mr. Speaker, Kids are being pulled out of classrooms to quarantine because of uncontrolled outbreaks in this province. Teachers are exhausted from trying to do everything in their power to help their kids because the government has failed them. Why did the government waste so many millions of dollars instead of listening to the health and education experts right here in the province of Ontario? Minister of education. Speaker, the true failure is the campaign of fear advanced by members opposite. Instead of standing with parents, all of whom face anxiety as we deal with a global pandemic, we are not an island of ourselves. We deal with this global challenge. And what are we doing in this province? The member opposite thankfully introduced a data point, which I know she normatively is averse to doing. Here's a statistic Order. that hopefully to an objective mind, not an ideological one, may instill some confidence. 99. 0.94% of students in this province do not have an active case. Most importantly, 99.8% of students never had a case of COVID in this Science province. Now, to Speaker, order. I recognize for each and every case it creates angst, but when you compare a plan, for example, to the next largest province, they have roughly four times the rate of transmission than in Ontario for schools. Response. And I know that is inconvenient, and I know it frustrates. The member for Davenport will come to order. The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing will come to order. I'm going to move on. The next question, member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Unlike the Premier, I want to thank the Auditor General for her report that she tabled yesterday. 
All her findings were signed off by officials. The AG notes that when testing and contact tracing is done effectively, a person's likelihood of transmitted COVID-19 can be reduced by 80%. That's why Ontarians were shocked to read that the province was delayed in expanding testing capacity, despite warnings to the Chief Medical Officer of Health by Public Health Ontario. It has long been clear that the government's plan has been, and response to COVID-19 has been opaque, reactionary, and marked by disorganization, secrecy, and chaos. Now we know that the Chief Medical Officer's advice has been filtered by a political committee. Ontarians deserve answers on how our leaders are making decisions with life and death decisions. We have just cleared Question. another grim milestone of deaths. Speaker, through you to, to the Minister or the Premier, will you commit today to work transparently with public health officials instead of working around them to restore the trust and confidence of Ontarians? Thank you very much. <laughs> Minister of Health. Um, it's hard to know where to start with that question. Uh, first of all, on the assertion that the Auditor General made that her report was signed off by the Deputy Minister of Health, that is not the case, nor would it be appropriate for the Deputy Minister to sign off. That is a decision for elected politicians to make. What the Deputy Minister signed off on was, as I indicated earlier, it was a document indicating that she had filed and provided all of the information that the Auditor General had requested for the purpose of her investigation. But she also attached 21 pages of factual inaccuracies that were not dealt with. And I think that's really important to remember in the context of the Auditor General's report. There are some comments Spons. that she makes with respect to some systemic issues, which we, of course, accept. Some of them relate to the failures of the previous government, their failure to act, their failure to update their pandemic response plan since 2013. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, I'm not going to quibble about who signed off on the report. This government has a very poor record of officials signing off on their reports. The government's delay the and fractured order. leadership has severely hampered the ability of public health units to carry out this process effectively in response to COVID-19. In October, the Toronto Public Health was so overwhelmed that it made the difficult decision to suspend contact tracing outside of outbreaks in congregant care settings. These local units need support, Speaker. They are now being asked to do more by this minister and this government. They need funds to do outreach in COVID hotspot areas. They are asking for this support. And despite the downloading of responsibilities to the public health units, this government has not provided any additional funding since the outset of the Question. pandemic, and they were shamefully left out of this government's recent budget. Speaker, through you, back to the minister, will you commit today to add funding public health units to do the important work that this province requires and that they are asking for. Thank you very much. <laughs> Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. To say that I disagree with everything the member opposite said would be a huge understatement. <laughs> we have put money in. We have put billions of dollars into protecting the health and well-being of the people of Ontario. We have put over a billion dollars in testing, tracing and contact management. We have put extra resources into the hotspot areas, into Toronto and Peel. We are moving forward with all of the recommendations that we were given by the Chief Medical Officer of Health and the uh, many other public health officials who have knowledge of what needs to be done here through Public Health Ontario, through the Public Health Measures Table, and the many, many public health physicians that stand behind them that are volunteering their time. To suggest that we are not acting on their response is, is completely wrong because, again, I have to speak for the numbers. Response. They speak for themselves. If we were doing everything wrong, why does Ontario stand number one in North America in terms of the lowest number of cases per 100,000. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question, member for Mississauga, Streetsville. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. We all know that small businesses are struggling due to COVID-19, and we've seen an incredible economic uncertainty here at home 
and around the world. I know our government is making unprecedented investments to support businesses today and help them survive the global pandemic. But our job creators will no doubt need help, even when the crisis is behind us. Minister, what is the government doing to prepare Ontario today and plan for our economic recovery tomorrow? The parliamentary assistant, member for Willowdale. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the member from Mississauga Streetsville. I know that small businesses in her riding are facing an incredible challenge during the second wave, and she's been an unrelenting, uh, unrelenting voice for them here at Queen's Park. Speaker, one day, and, and hopefully soon, COVID-19 will be behind us. And when that time comes, every jurisdiction in the world will be competing for jobs and investments. Ontario must be ready. And while our focus right now is on protecting Ontarians and supporting businesses, we're also looking around the corner and laying that foundation for recovery. That's why in our budget, Ontario's action plan, Support, Protect, Recover, our government is investing $4.8 billion in measures that provide direct supports to businesses today and set them up for success and growth tomorrow. The supplementary question. I thank the parliamentary system for that answer. Ontario is the economic engine of our country, and my city of Mississauga is home to some incredible job creators. For years, the previous government's burdensome red tape, skyrocketing hydro bills and rising taxes drove companies' jobs and investment out of my community. As the parliamentary system noted, when this pandemic is behind us, Ontario can't afford to be second. Can the Minister of Finance explain how the $4.8 billion of investment in Ontario's recovery will provide the immediate support businesses need and make us competitive for the future global economy? Thank you. Again, the parliamentary assistant. Thank you, Speaker. Ontario's action plan focuses on reducing the immediate fixed costs that job creators pay today, like employer health tax, a tax on jobs, uh, the provincial portion of commercial property taxes, and industrial electricity rates, just to name a few. These are real costs for businesses, Speaker, big and small, and they're paying it today. And that's why our government is reducing them or eliminating them permanently. And as every business owner knows, Speaker, a dollar saved is a dollar earned. But these measures also lay the foundation for future economic success. The reductions in electricity costs, for example, will take Ontario from the least competitive jurisdiction for energy to one of the most competitive out there. These measures, Speaker, have an instant impact, but they also prepare us for that important economic success in the months and years ahead when COVID-19 is nothing more than a memory. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for London Fanshawe. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. After COVID-19 outbreaks were initially reported in two units at London Health Sciences Centre University Hospital on November 10th and November 11th, the Middlesex Health Unit is reporting that outbreaks have now spread to all medical floors at the hospital. With that, with that news, there are significant cases among patients and staff. The people in my community are worried. They're worried for their loved ones at work, in, or are getting treatment at University Hospital, and they're worried for themselves in case they need urgent care. According to Dr. Matt Mackey, Medical Officer of Health, the expanded outbreak is alarming and said the health unit is working closely with the hospital officials to implement additional measures, including halting admissions for the next week, but they cannot do it alone. How is this government going to help London Health Sciences University Hospital pull through this crisis? Thank you very much, Minister of Health. Well, I thank the member very much for the question. This has been a concern at uh, a number of hospitals in Ontario uh, with COVID because of staff uh, contracting COVID and some of the, the, uh, the patients as well. However, they have specific procedures for outbreak management within those hospitals that they are working on to contain the spread to make sure that the staff, if they're ill, of course, they need to uh, be tested and, and be at home. But at, for the patients there, there are rigorous procedures that are set in place. We are involved with the hospitals on a daily basis to understand if they need any further human resources or any other resources in order to deal with it. But uh, we are finding that the hospitals are doing a very good job at containing the outbreaks and protecting the patients within the hospital. Supplementary. 
Speaker, I've heard from families who didn't learn about the outbreak from the hospital, even though their loved ones were receiving treatment from there. They learned about it from the media. I've heard from families who, after being assured their loved one was in a safe place in the hospital, they received a call the next day informing them that their loved ones had caught COVID. I've heard from families that, due to the resulting changes to the hospital's visitor policy, they've had to fight to be by their dying loved one's side. Needless to say, this is a horrible reality that no family should have to live through. What is this government's plan to ensure that no other family has to live through this horrible tragedy? Mr. Hill. Well, thank you. I, I believe there are several issues here. One is the issue of community transmission that I know Dr. Mackey is working very hard to contain, and he uh, provides us with regular updates about what is happening in his community. He speaks with Dr. Williams, and then decisions are made whether to move your community from green to yellow, yellow to orange, orange to red, with increasing restrictions based on that. So that is one way that we are dealing with that, is by being in touch with the local medical officer of health and putting in more restrictions if that's necessary in the community. In the hospital, most hospitals right now um, have patients with COVID within their hospitals, and they are using very, very specific precautionary procedures to deal with, the, with both the patients as well as the staff, making sure that the staff have the necessary personal protective equipment, making sure Bonds. that only certain and staff are working in those areas. We are working very hard to contain the response with respect to COVID within every hospital, and they do have very, very specific, careful procedures for dealing with that. Thank you very much. The next question, member for Guelph. Morning, Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Oakville, Burlington, Halton Hills, Mississauga, Guelph, Thunder Bay, Milton, the list of municipalities asking this government to cancel its rollback of flood protection is growing by the day. Despite the patronizing claim from government that they are helping conservation authorities achieve their goal, conservation authorities are saying that Bill 229 will gut their ability to protect us from flooding at a huge cost to people and communities because they are giving the minister the power to override science-based decisions. So, Speaker. Can the Premier explain to the people of this province how the minister can possibly be better qualified to determine the safety of building on a floodplain than experts trained in watershed management Question. and flood mitigation? To respond for the government, the member for Barry Innisfil in Parliament. Thank you, Speaker. Well, over the past year and a half, uh, as you know, the government consulted broadly with a wide range of stakeholders about the role of conservation authorities in protecting and preserving Ontario's natural spaces. And through those consultations, one being in my backyard of Barrie, we heard from many organizations, conservation authorities, environmental organizations, people across the province, of how we can improve uh, the, cons the consistency and transparency of all CAs. Uh, and, and through that, uh, we've uh, made uh, several changes we're proposing, but it, it still means we're still resolute in our commitment to making sure we have uh, far-reaching changes that increase the accountability, consistency, and transparency. Uh, and of course, um, these proposed changes are a mechanism that, uh, that we want to ensure that there's consistency across the sector and uh, that we can listen to all parties involved. And, uh, one thing that we want to be crystal clear on, Speaker, is that um, in any myths that Response. are out there is about permitting decisions, and the decisions are still based on science that are considered in Section 28.1, and uh, just as they did previously, that will continue and uh, full stop from there, so we don't need to fear monger. Thank you. Supplementary question. Speaker, speaking of the member opposite's backyard, I'd like to quote from a press release from the Lake Simcoe Region Conservation Authority, calling on the province to, I quote, repeal Schedule 6 of Budget Measures Bill 229. I'd like to offer a second quote from the same Conservation Authority, and I quote, the changes will in fact strip conservation authorities of our ability to ensure that people, infrastructure, and the environment are protected from damage and destruction that cannot be repaired. So I don't know who the government consulted with, but it doesn't seem like they consulted with and or listened to the very people who for over 70 years 
have made Ontario a jurisdiction that Question. to prevent flooding. So I ask the member opposite, through you, Speaker, will the government listen to local leaders today and commit to removing and cancelling their attack on conservation authorities' ability to protect the flooding? Member for Barry Innisfil. Thank you, Speaker, and I, and I thank uh, the Local Conservation Authority for their work, and I work quite closely with them, actually, on improving uh, Lake Simcoe, as I mentioned yesterday in this House. But let me be crystal clear to help bust any myths that, uh, about the Minister's uh, permitting, permitting decisions uh, in these situations uh, that uh, the member is discussing. The exact same criteria, standards, definitions, or rules will be considered, and the rigor remains unchanged in these changes. Decisions will be based on science that's considered in Section 28 one a b and c in the act just as they did previously that will continue full stop municipalities and provinces will continue to be able to work with conservation authorities and rely on their advice and support for appeals and planning decisions increasing accountability consistency and transparency by streamlining land use uh, planning processes through the one window approach but the liberals the greens Response. the ndp they like to pontificate on i'd uh, like the pulpit about the importance of conservation authorities but interestingly enough not once is it featured in their environment plans thank you thank you the next question the member for windsor to come to thank you speaker my question is for the premier of the government house leader good morning minister speaker we're dealing with a worldwide pandemic we're told to wash our hands frequently to protect ourselves my windsor office tells me people are having their water shut off because they're falling behind on their payments. Speaker, why is the government allowing local utilities commissions to cut off water service during a pandemic? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I do, I do appreciate the Honourable Member for raising, uh, for raising this with me. Uh, I have done a little bit of work uh, on it since he, he first raised it with me. It's my understanding, he is quite correct, that a uh, uh, local utility did uh, provide a, a, a moratorium on disconnections in March, which they have since uh, let, uh, let expire. Obviously, we're going to take a look at that, Mr. Speaker. My understanding is this is the same utility that uh, was uh, charged by the Ontario Energy Board, uh, uh, significant, significantly charged by the Ontario Energy Board for uh, um, uh, disconnecting hydro uh, uh, earlier than they should have. So he raises a very important point. Obviously, this is uh, extremely important, and uh, that's the information I have for him right now, and I will look into it further for him. Supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Some utilities commissions contract out their bill collection services. These contractors just don't care about a pandemic or hygiene. They just want their commissions. Will the government give us a clear commitment today that no one else in Ontario will lose their access to water because they're falling behind on their bill payments and being hounded by collection agencies? And the government has to. Uh, again, uh, again, as I said, uh, thank the honourable member. He sincerely brought this to me uh, uh, a little bit earlier, and I, I do appreciate that. I have been doing a little bit of work uh, since he first brought it uh, to me. He is quite correct. Uh, uh, having access to uh, uh, to uh, water during a pandemic is incredibly important. So uh, he has my uh, uh, firm commitment that, uh, upon the conclusion of question period today, I will uh, reach out to the minister of, uh, of energy and uh, inquire for him uh, immediately on this. The next question, the member for Ottawa, Ben. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, in a recent environmental audit, the Auditor General highlighted the failure of this government to ensure meaningful public participation in decision-making processes regarding the environment. Concerns included not giving the public ample time to respond to complex proposal, not notifying the public of decision in a timely manner, and not providing a sufficient amount of information to the public. In Bill 229, the government continues this trend of throwing caution to the wind and making reckless changes to the statutes that protect our, our environment without meaningful consultation. Could the Premier explain what concrete actions, if any, are being taken to address the Auditor's general concern as they relate to the proposed changes to conservation authorities under Schedule 6 of Bill 229? Reply on behalf of the government. 
The member for Barry Ennisville and parliamentary thank system. You. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, we thank uh, for for, the, for those findings. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, um, of course, uh, there's examples of when our government uh, is working to ensure Canadian uh, Ontarians uh, have additional time to share feedback. Uh, of course, uh, it was through this government that we made changes to the EBR to encourage uh, more public uh, consultations and it, 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 its ability uh, to be. It's something that's easier for people to use so they can add the comment. But in addition, uh, is a seen on in July, the ministry initiated a 45-day consultation period on proposed amendments to eight class environmental assessments, uh, four proposals to extend projects related to Indigenous land claim settlements, projects within provincial park conservation reserves, and select uh, Ministry of Transportation projects. Additional consultation time was also provided for Indigenous communities as well as other agencies who specifically requested extension. So there Response. is proof that we have extensions. And again, in September, the ministry also posted a proposed list of projects that would be subject to comprehensive assessment for 60 days comment period. And so these are examples of how we have been opening up. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Speaker, watersheds are not bound by municipal borders. The failure of one municipality to protect its watershed affects every municipality within that watershed. This is exactly why each conservation authority includes multiple municipalities so that the entire watershed is managed in a consistent way. The changes proposed in Bill 229, however, would require conservation authorities to make separate agreements with each individual municipality, meaning that some municipalities could decide to protect their watershed while others do not. Can the Premier explain how allowing each municipality to manage their section of the watershed in their own way will contribute to stronger overall watershed management in Ontario? Again, the reply, the member for Barry Innisfil. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Speaker. And again, we're helping um, conservation authorities re reach their goals uh, by uh, improving uh, improving uh, their operations and giving them more transparency. But it's rich coming from the member because um, you know she represents a party that carved into the green belt. 17 different times making it look like Swiss cheese, so I question their uh, ideals on the environment. And even their own leader, Del Duca, and she knows this, uh, had railroaded their, their own conservation authority's um, recommendation so that he, uh, he could put in a private pool, Mr. Speaker. Um, so when it comes to the interests of Ontarians and, of course, protecting the environment, uh, this government has a legacy of protecting the environment, whether it's the living legacy find the Oak Ridges Marine. It was under a con conservative government in 1946 that George A. Dew's government created conservation authorities. And we're continuing Order. to focus on conservation authorities and the Response. environment that we mention in our environment plan, unlike your party who doesn't even mention them in your environment plan. Thank you. The next question, the member for Hamilton West and Castor Dundas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question this morning is for the Premier. Uh, the City of Hamilton, mayors across uh, Ontario, provincial watchdogs, citizens groups like Environment Hamilton, and thousands, thousands of Ontarians across the province have raised concerns with Schedule 6 of Bill 229. This will gut the ability of conservation authorities to protect our wetlands and our watersheds. Yet the MPP for Flamborough Glanbrook has called these legitimate concerns just a lot of noise from special interest groups. My question, does the Premier support these types of comments? Member for Barry Innisfield to reply. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And uh, our focus is clear. Uh, conservation authorities are featured in the Made in Terror Environment Plan, which lays out a framework for how we're protecting the environment, not only strengthening and improving our conservation authorities by delivering on something the Auditor General uh, pointed out in her report, which is the lack of transparency. We had conservation authorities across this province that were uh, building on wetlands, something that I know members opposite would disagree with. And so, again, this is a common standard across, uh, again, proving uh, the record of this government when it comes to. Uh, the environment and improving conservation authorities. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, we were the, it was this government that created uh, the conservation authorities under George A. Drew, and uh, we won't be taking lessons from the New Democrats who had several chances to talk about the environment and their platform and conservation authorities. It wasn't there. And then they introduced their Green New Democratic deal, and it had no mention of conservation authorities. So it's interesting that you're curious about Response. them now, but all along this government has been taking action and we're delivering on goals and accomplishments. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary question. 
Speaker, I would just like to say this government has not taken lessons from anyone when it comes to the environment. And with answers like this, all I can say is thank goodness for the Auditor General. Because the Auditor General just issued a scathing report on this government's record on the environment. I mean, the Auditor General, among other things, saying that you are not giving the public enough time to weigh on important environmental issues that, that impact their communities. This bill just does exactly that. I mean, the Auditor General, in fact, said that you're not even compliant with, with the Environmental Bill of Rights. But what we see is PC donors being awarded development contracts impacting provincial significant wetlands and ministerial zoning orders that are being taking place in protected wetlands. So my question, really, how is anyone in Ontario supposed to take you seriously and supposed to trust that you are making decisions for what's best for our environment and not for your donors? Remind members to make their comments to the chair. To reply, the member for Barry Innisfil. Thank you, uh, thank you, Speaker. And again, uh, uh, when it comes to strengthening this environment, we have a proven record. We're not just talking the talk; we're actually walking the walk. Again, in strengthening our conservation authorities. Again, talking about cleaning up our communities. I mean, the member opposite might find it laughable, but these are things that matter to people, so they can actually be empowered to do something about their environment and, and practice personal responsibility. Something that I know members opposite don't believe in personal responsibility. If it's up to them, they would ban everything in life. But on this side of the house, uh, every member of our, uh, our caucus cares about the environment, whether it's the Minister's transportation through her transportation bill, who's lowering greenhouse gas emissions by getting less cars of the road, off the road, whether it's our Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport, who's increasing the amount of people that are connecting with nature by improving tourism in our parks. Mr. Speaker, I can name countless examples of other members of our caucus who care about the environment, because on this side of the House, not just the Minister of the Environment, it's the whole government. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period for this morning. The government house